My name is Allison Berryhill, and I am in Audubon County, Iowa. Today is Wednesday, February 9th, and I'm interviewing, excuse me, it's not Wednesday, it's Tuesday. It's, <laughs> today is Tuesday, February 9th, and I'm interviewing Jamie Langley from Austin, Texas for the Oral History Project titled COVID-19, Teacher Poets Writing to Bridge the Distance, which will be archived by Oklahoma State University Oral History Research Program. So hello, Jamie. Hi, and thank to... you, Allison. Um, I'm Jamie Langley, and I am a teacher in Austin, Texas. Um, I became a teacher after I had children. It was one of those things I always joke, I grew up and knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, and it just seemed like kind of a perfect thing to do. I um, had small jobs that I did, but um, the flexibility of teaching as a parent is a pretty nice situation. Um, today, I teach at the Ann Richard School for Young Women Leaders, which is a public girls' school in Austin, Texas. Um, it's definitely an urban setting, but um, we're modeled after the Harlem Girls' School, and there are other leadership academies for girls. And so it's this blend of public school and girls' schools um, with the idea of um, creating leadership, but also giving them opportunities they might not normally have. So it's a great place to be. How are you guys meeting right now um, in the pandemic? Um, so right now we're still remote, but that's gonna change on Tuesday next week. Um, we've just as a city gone from being stage five to stage four. And it's just a numbers calculated on number of cases we have and what our hospital situation looks like. So we're improving, but that means we'll go back to school and have rotations next week. And you said go back to school. Do, were you meeting face to face at the beginning of the year at all? Um, we've had some face to face learning, but it's been really small out of a school of 800. I don't think we've had more than 80 or 120 girls there at any given time. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of our seniors and juniors feel like, you know, the seniors feel like they're doing their senior year remotely and our juniors feel like they're hoping to come back for their senior year. Yeah. yeah. And um, how has that been impacting your teaching this year? Um, it's been, I feel like I have a million pieces or I say a million moving parts all the time. Because normally if we go in and teach to a classroom, we've got lesson plans and things but we don't have to do so much to display it. Um, so we have a learning, we use Blend, which is a Canva model. And then, you know, I use a PowerPoint within that. And it's just all the pieces that you have to make sure you have linked up and who was in class today and who wasn't. Um, I find that teaching juniors, a lot of my students work. Mm. And um, so sometimes they can make it to class, sometimes they can't, sometimes they're time after class is more limited. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're trying not to give so much homework, even though I teach an AP class. Yeah. So it's a balancing act. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we are here today to document the impact of COVID-19 on educators and education. And so I'm, I'm gonna ask you to go back to the spring of 2020 and um, ask you to talk about how you learned that teachers in your state would be teaching remotely or what that looked like, um, that your school buildings were be, would be closing. Can you remember that specific moment and what that felt like and how you responded? So yeah, um, at the end of our February, we had a faculty meeting where our principal mentioned this possibility and it seemed so remote at the time. I mean, it seemed possibility. And so as I'm the English department chair at our school and I arranged to have a tech person come in and meet with us at our next department meeting, just, you know, in case it happens, let's get the training and get some ideas. And I thought meeting as a department would be good because we would have similar practices in our classrooms. So we did that. And later that week, South by Southwest, which is a big event for Austin was canceled. Yeah. And that seemed real. Um, and South by Southwest is a tech and an education, all kinds of music and film um, conference, but people come from all over the world. Uh -huh. And then it was like, oh, this is, for our mayor to cancel this, this is kind of a big deal. <laughs> and then basketball season ended. 
Oh, and I remember Dallas's coach talking about it and he's kind of a hothead. So if like he was going along with it again, it was one of these signs that, you know, people who normally wouldn't go along with extreme change are going along with something like this. Um, so the day before spring break, which was March 13th, and might've been a date that you remember too, mm -hmm. um, we, school was canceled. We were asked to get everything out of our room that we might need from teaching, for teaching at home. Okay. And you know, one of my distinct memories was watering the plants on the window, but leaving them because I thought, oh, I'll be back in a few weeks. Water them, they're in the sun. Yeah. Grabbed a few books that I thought about what I'm teaching next and left thinking, you know, I'd be back April, May. Yeah. Um, and so it was pretty startling to then have things shift so much. Yeah. Around the same time that schools were closing, uh, National Poetry Month began, April. So we were about two weeks into our uh, the, the chaos there that ensued right after um, everything was was shut down. And you, along um, with other educators, participated in writing a poem a day that month. Can you talk about writing um, poetry during that early part of the pandemic? Yeah, and um, so I have always wanted to dedicate time to writing during National Poetry Month. Yeah. But most of the time we're pretty busy and um, Really, the COVID period afforded time and space for this. I was teaching totally remotely at the time. And, you know, it was just, I had, I'd say more control over my time than I expected to. And so because of that, um, I was able to make the commitment and really did it, you know, which was pretty nice. And did you write every day? Did you I did. That's um, awesome. And so even if it was at 11 o'clock at night, I still made myself sit down and write before I went to bed. That's great. Now, you said that you were teaching at the time. Were students required? Our, in Iowa, we couldn't require anything. They just showed up if they kind of wanted to. It was like we provided opportunities, but nothing was required. So as far as grades were, the grades had gotten sealed prior to this time. But being an AP teacher, my students had the motivation to come in and prepare for an AP exam. Okay. And we also did not require, even the students who had signed up for it earlier in the year, we gave them the option to opt out. Mm -hmm. But most of the girls followed through and took the AP exam, which I thought was pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, so I had, you know, like a pretty strong mission to get them ready for that exam and AP modified their plans. And um, I felt like it worked well. And you know, I, clearly I didn't see all my students, but I saw enough of them that I felt good about. I just decided to worry about those I saw yeah. and not worry about yeah. good. what I didn't do. Well, would you like to share one of the poems that you wrote during that time? Yeah. Um, so it was a poem, and this is at the very beginning, first few okay. days, called Song Lyrics. Mm -hmm. And I'll share the poem first, and then I'll share a little bit about it. Um, and it began with, if my words did glow with the gold of sunshine, song lyrics, ripple in still water when there is no pebble tossed, no wind to blow. On any given day, in any given moment, words ripple through my soundtrack of life, a link to the moment. How the hell can a person go to work in the morning and come home in the evening and have nothing to say? 20 year old me could never have imagined how do people let go? Go to the country, build you a home, plant a little garden, eat a lot of peaches, not far from our urban garden, edged by peach trees. Come on home, come on home. No, you don't want to be alone. Just come on home. Left me weeping, thinking of Rachel alone in Mexico City in this time of Corona. So easy for the words to ripple through. Um, so a lot of the songs are John Prine songs because if you're a John Prine song fan and you know he passed away of COVID early in April and so it was um, I guess it's a great testament to be able to leave music like that for the world and then the last song was also his lyrics but just made me think about my daughter in Mexico and you know her dad and I wondered should we make her come home or just 
let it happen. So that's what happened. Wow. Um, yeah, my sister is the big John Prine fan and, and that hit her hard too. It was, oh, oh. Lovely poem though, mixing your, your like, did you have, were any of the lines from um, an artist be, besides John Prine or were they all Prine? No, the first one were um, Grateful Dead lyrics. Okay. The ripple, ripple through, ripple in still water. Okay. And um, uh, do you remember what our prompt was that day? That you I wrote? think it was something about blending music. Okay. But, um, and he was just so heavy on my mind. He was in the hospital in Nashville. I have a friend whose daughter was working in the hospital. And so I'd get little words from her about like when he was pronate, um, which are all different things we've learned now about <laughs> good hospital practices. Um, but, um, you know, he was a man who had already suffered from cancer in his earlier life and yeah. had still, and I'd seen him in Austin probably two years before Wow. So my father's death anniversary is around that time. And so I had all these candles in the house and I thought um, in the Jewish faith, we call it a yard site candle to remember somebody. So I had thought, well, um, light the candle for my dad and then John Prine died. And so I thought, oh, it'll be two people that the candles lit for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was lovely. Um, as you read that poem now today, uh, how do you feel and what do you notice? Um, well, and because I've been looking at it for a day or so, I'm surprised at how I still have that little. I heard it. I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, my daughter is still in Mexico City and things have changed, but still there's that remoteness of her being down there. And um, as her older sister and I have started our like both of us have had our first vaccines like Rachel doesn't have a hope of getting a vaccination down there which she shouldn't but then is she going to be here long enough to get both of them yeah um, yeah so there are just certain things I think and I guess for anybody who chooses to live in a country that's not theirs that you make um concessions and mm -hmm. Um, COVID-19 impacted states and schools in different ways. And how did your state or school respond? And how did the policies impact your work as an educator? So um, things happened first on a district level. And so okay. all of our activity of the spring was governed by our district who made us all remote, who made the decisions about grading not being counted. Um, so all of our students in high school had technology and I think eighth grade through 12th grade did. We got technology, um, either laptops or iPads for our sixth and seventh graders, but then there was connectivity. Oh, and so wow. our school buses became um, internet hubs throughout the community, which was crazy to think of. Um, and I thought it was kind of a practical use, but the connectivity is not equitable. Yeah. And, um, so that's been an issue. And I would say it was an issue in the spring when we didn't really gather as a class too frequently. Mm -hmm. I had office hours, my advisory met once a week, but I didn't have class per se. They were always asynchronous. Mm -hmm. And so when students had tech problems, you know, I always felt a little bad for those kiddos who don't have phones that have all the resources that other homes do. And then I had kids who worked. Some kids were working 40 hours a week, like in grocery stores. And that was hard. Um, and so I was just wholly impressed with what they did do and tried to focus on that and not yeah. what wasn't happening. Uh, what issues in education were revealed to you as a result of school closing? Now, you mentioned the inequality of the um, connectivity and, and things like that. But did other aspects of education reveal themselves to you when our normal way of doing things was taken away? So I definitely had to narrow my focus. Ah. So without talking about how difficult and what a challenge it was to manage the technology, 
um, it was the narrowing the focus. Okay, like what are we gonna really do? What is most important? And like I said, again, because of it being an AP class, we had a test. And AP really responded pretty quickly. Um, I don't know how much you know about what went on, but instead of having three essays in multiple choice, we had a single essay prompt. Okay. And I knew about it, um, I would say within the first few weeks, what the prompt was gonna be. And then it was just a matter of, okay, it's the rhetorical analysis prompt, it maybe wasn't my first choice, but that's what I'm teaching between now and the middle of May when they take their exam. And so that was nice. And AP was really good about, they met with us a couple of times every month. Um, and it was cute. The um, director who met with us was in New York City. And so I don't know if you remember at seven o'clock when the um, hospital staff changed, there was all this banging of pots and pans in the street. And so, so our meetings would usually close with that. And that was kind uh -huh. of nice to have that kind of more universal connectivity. Um, so that was a really helpful thing. And then in the summer, when we started planning for this year, we still knew that we needed to scale back, that there were too many unknowns about the coming year. I mean, I think we all expected to be back at school full time by now. Mm -hmm. um, so we were all in this place of let's scale back our teaching to what we really need to teach, um, not necessarily teaching our favorite things, but teaching the things that students really need. Um, and I think that's been good for our teaching practice. Yeah. Um, sometimes I don't think I get to the fun things as much as I might have normally, uh -huh. um, but try to work on what I do teach as engaging. Um, I also teach ninth grade English, which is not quite as um, strict in structure and focus as AP. Mm -hmm. um, but with them, I'm more concerned with, this is your first year of high school. And even though it's unlike any other year of high school for any other student, you know, I still want it to have that little mark of it being different than eighth grade and the beginning of something. And what is it the beginning of? Um, so just trying to find those markers. And then I would say probably in the thing that happened, you know, right up on COVID um, after George Floyd was killed, this big shift to looking at equity and an anti-racist curriculum. And so those have been really the guiding pieces. Um, sometimes I wonder if we shouldn't have been surprised that something like that happened in the midst of that, or um, it's hard to know, but it, things are definitely not isolated in yes. preparing to teach. Yeah. Yeah. And looking what matters. That narrowing of focus was, um, when you said that, I, I thought, oh, she listened to my interview. <laughs> that re it really did that to you, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. Um, did any of these issues that you were experiencing either with school or um, um, the, the equity issues um, impact your poetry at all? Were you seeing this reflected in your poetry? So a little bit. And um... You know, I would say more just um, the feeling of what it was like teaching in that time is what I saw in my poetry more. Um, would you like to share a second poem with us? I would. Um, and I call it At the Table because I was teaching from the dining room table. Okay. <laughs> is that where you're at now? No, now oh. I'm in my study. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> my partner and I have done some rearranging in our house to accommodate to work from home with people. So at the table, facing the screen, waiting for them to arrive, a candle flickers anchoring me to this place. As they arrive, hellos are exchanged and should we wait another minute to start? Weather checked in, brought lots of partly cloudy. This is how we talk when we share a table. Intention, spoken, patience, sustainability, motivation, relaxed, fluid, schedule or not, conscious, thought, visible and faces in the grid across my screen. So begins the last day of the week, one in the remote classroom, two show up for office hours, a little English talk about their reading, lots of time, happy to talk to familiar people, easy conversation, wow. hey, Ms. Langley. The last class is small, Class begun with how are you been? How have you been doing? Conversation was easy. We've been doing it for months. Kate shared a book talk, missed the 
day class was canceled. A little talk about two stories, energy lacking. Now faces frozen in squares. Words are easy, but something is missing. Really nice. When you say that, um, the, the sharing the, the question, lots of partly cloudy, was this like people sharing their own personal what's your weather report? Yeah. <laughs> no, and I was always trying to ask, so what's bringing you a little sunshine? <laughs> <laughs> and they're all partly cloudy. Oh, really good. As you revisit this writing, what do you notice now? Um, it's actually the the nice feeling of seeing them and hearing them. And um, so that Kate was someone who I had done a small class with and it was a women's lit class. And so it was just like five or six of us that we would meet and talk about whatever I had picked for them to read. <laughs> sometimes we talked about it and sometimes we didn't. And it was just, I think we all needed that time together just to talk to each other. And it didn't matter that it was about a class. It was just... I know I've, um, I, I've talked to several teachers who have really struggled with the online teaching. And when I read your poem that you just read to us now, I thought that um, it, it felt like you were expressing a lot of warmth and positivity about this, seeing your students and interacting with them on, on screen. No, it was, I mean, I felt like it was something I missed doing, yeah. you know, making videos is not what I missed too. <laughs> oh yeah. Now some states continued uh, with distance learning through the end of the school year 2020. Um, and how did your school end? So we did. Um, and um, I would say by the end of May, everything was wrapped up. Um, you know, I got my girls through their AP exam and I was really proud of them. I mean, this idea of normally we're all in the gym and they're all on tables and chairs spaced all over the place and it's super quiet. And these guys had to wake up in the morning at home and yeah. make sure, I mean, like we went over the practice and most of them take AP US history too. So that teacher and I really worked with them. We both had little cheer meetings that morning before the exam to one, make sure that they're up and ready and if they have any questions, but two, just to, give them the pat on the back and let them know how much we appreciate it and see that they're doing and yeah, yeah they did great. Um, I right. was really pleased. So um, I don't know if I could have done that at 16. Yeah. Oh. How did your um, kids graduate? How did your school deal with that? So um, they had, we did a school thing and then the district did something later, but we did a drive through, through at school, which was really fun. And so we teachers lined a driveway and the girls were up on their cars and some of them had them decorated like floats and some of them just more shy inside, but we had good music playing and we waved and threw kisses and it was great. I mean, in some ways it's better than all that pomp and circumstance. <laughs> <laughs> Big gym downtown and you know, yeah. we're in a room sequestered and wearing our caps and gowns and oh, fancy shoes. So that's I cool. don't want to go for that again, but we'll see. Nice. Um, as we, as you've, you've answered a little bit of this about um, what changes you experienced in your teaching practices, but there's another question here that says, uh, what changes did you experience in your relationships with students, families, and colleagues? So in the spring, um, the students who stayed in with us, I feel like I was really close with. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the kiddos just wrote me this morning that she got into BU, mm -hmm. which was her choice school. And she is someone who at the very end of May said to me, "Miss Langley, I need to meet with you one day. And it was to ask me to write her college recommendation. And as you can guess, being a junior English teacher, I do a lot of that. Yes, so <laughs> <laughs> I've had um, lots of, you know, pleasant surprises. The girls are getting into schools and that's been nice. And so I think the staying in touch was good um, for the girls who really wanted to work and excel on the AP exam. 
we worked pretty steadily. They kind of, I gave them the choice of an exam, an essay every other week or an essay a week, and they wanted an essay a week. And so they got an assignment. I talked to them about, based on what I'd seen last week, these are some things you need to pay attention to. And AP had videos for them. I kind of went through and um, made suggestions on this is a video I'd spend time with and then we had lots of either individual conferences or group conferences yeah. um, and that's what my office hours looked like and so for those girls I mean I'm super close with them yeah. I you know, feel like we've spent so much time we could probably go back and talk about some of those speeches or letters or whatever it was they were analyzing at the time and um, you know I can remember moments so for those guys it stayed strong for the ones who, for whatever reason, had to pull out. Um, it's not as much as it was for those. Um, and, you know, it looked that way in advisory too. For my advisory, it was, I had my regulars and I had my sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like one of my kiddos who was a regular had done a um, internship or not an internship, some special travel student program in Russia the year before. And so she was, doing two online Russian language programs, you know, like super motivated. My um, cross country girls would run, you know, they had lots of things that they brought to their lives while they were home alone with their parents or their yeah. siblings forever and ever and ever. Um, Did you have any uh, changes, uh, uh, positive, negative uh, with your colleagues at all? How did that work? Um, so in the beginning, we, it was really positive. I would say um, we, were, we spent a lot of department time. It seemed like our school focused on getting us to have more department meetings and fewer big faculty meetings, I guess, thinking that the curriculum work we did would be more consistent within a department. Um, and so those of us who were English teachers, I mean, one, I have a small department. We know each other well, and we welcomed seeing each other too. We're, you know, we were also in a home with two or some of us have children, you know, but yeah, you know, even my colleagues who like being alone, I think we're happy to see each other. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, since then I have lost one department member that just things did not work out as I'm sure a lot of schools have that, that over these, you know, the fall, we probably had our largest loss of teachers um, and one in my department and it's just, you know, like there are no answers to the problems that individual families have. There are all kinds of circumstances. And, um, you know, the school was only so flexible and the state was only so flexible and the district was only so flexible. And um, I think we'll lose good teachers because of this. Has your um, school uh, faculty stayed healthy or how has that gone? Um, we actually have, I can think of only a, one instance of a teacher who had COVID and um, at our school, and I'm sure it's because of the few numbers, there has not been a spread. There have definitely been cases, but when they pop up, it's isolated and there's been no spread. So um, the idea that we're going to go back to ro rotations next week, I feel pretty comfortable. I, one, I don't feel like there'll be that many kids on campus. And two, I just think you know, with the safety measures. And in some ways, I think the rotation is better because you're not in the same room with the same kids all day, like. So explain that to me. So we've had situate, like the first phase of going back and I didn't go back because of a health accommodation, but everybody was in the same room all day. And so one teacher might have six kids all day in her room. Mm -hmm. um, but we started rotating in October and November. And then they actually did normal schedule of I'll be in this class for 45 minutes and then um, stay and get my work done. And then I'll move to the next class. And Still very small classes. Yeah. So the kids were not coming every day. No. And so um, like my colleague, who's the AP history teacher, she said, you know, I might have two kids in one class. Mm -hmm. And then I have most classes where I have nobody. Yeah. You know? But she said in the given day that she would never see even six or eight kids. Oh, so um, I feel like with those kinds of numbers, there's less of a chance of spread. Um, a little bit with athletics as usual. Yeah, yeah. Even in a girl's school. <laughs> oh. 
Uh, if there was anything that you could go back and change if you could, uh, what would you change? Um, I really think that it was, I mean, I feel like, like I said, the relationships with students were strong um, with those I saw regularly. Our administration, I think really did well and our department stayed tighter. Um, and I think the reaching out to students who we didn't see would be my place of, um, and I mean, we did all kinds of things, you know, from texting instead of calling because my students told me, oh, my number said you were a spam. <laughs> but, um, and I have a colleague now who's texting the parents because she feels like a parent doesn't really want to answer her calls, but at least we'll see her text. And yeah, there are just ways. And I don't think it's the same with younger students as it is with older students that um, parents, um, but it's hard. I feel like um, so much of our school has been the community and- oh. And what do you do in your communities? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Disturbed. Um, oh. um, any aha moments or silver linings? I mean, you said that your AP kids just did super well and that you found yourself really close with, with some of your students. <laughs> Is there anything else that you wanted to highlight? Um, I think working from this, and this is a little bit different, but working from home sometimes, and I think I'm gonna to have to let a dog out. Um, working from home, it's sometimes hard to separate your life from your school. Yeah. Like, um, and that's, I mean, that's something I still struggle with today. And can you give me a moment? So I'm- I sure will, I'm gonna put it on pause. I'll okay. pause our recording, okay. okay. Do you have another poem you'd like to share with us? I do. Um, and do you know when you wrote this one, where it fell in the sequence? Yes, and you may remember this. This was from um, August okay. when we were not, and um, it was a poem prompt called Weather. Okay. So picking up a little bit on that partly cloudy idea. And oh, so- I'm trying to remember that prompt. Um, it tied to a Claudia Rankin poem. And then we were, we were just, we were using weather as a, I'm going to have to go look up mine after we're done. So <laughs> go ahead and, and share it with us. So it's called weather. On a morning in March, I visited my classroom to gather items from my classroom, not imagining time to be long. I watered and left my plants on the bookshelves by the windows. I discovered that during a pandemic, I can get along with fewer decisions. What to expect is clearly not the lens we are using. The structure of a calendar opens in new ways, allowing space for personalization, more for me in my life than the anticipated role of personalization in my newly forming classes. I became a practicing writer. As I led my students through weekly essays preparing for an AP exam, one writer leading many writers I moved through April losing a favorite musician, Passover for two, and no clear vision of what might be next. What to expect is clearly not the lens we are using. Before long, it was May with traditional end of year landmarks, but without the structure of days of the weeks, 11th graders waking up and coming together before logging on to a 45 minute exam from the comfort of more than 80 bedrooms around the city, outscoring the students of the past in rows of tables and chairs in a gymnasium. What to expect is clearly not the lens we are using. Some are mounted into a Dolly-esque landscape that I accepted control, adding a workout to my days of walking dogs and riding. School schedules as varied as elastic ties I used to tie my hair back came and went. I planned in fits and starts, fed by anti-racist ideas for revisioning curriculum, narrowing a focus, Online instruction seasoned my thinking, books took turns on my nightstand, filled my head and days. Tomorrow our faculty meets for the first day to plan and learn about an upcoming year. What to expect is clearly not the lens we are using. 
Oh, I love how that line keeps saying something additional each time you repeat it, really. And um, our seniors are having a case of the blues. And so we as the faculty are all gonna videotape some, a message to them. And when I came across that today, I thought I should use that line. Yes, yes. Um, pat them on the back, tell them yeah. that their experience is none, not like any of ours, but yeah. Mm. Oh, all right. Well, let's take a look at what's next, Jamie. Um, uh, you, you, actually, we began our discussion with you talking about what's happening now in your school. Um, what is teaching like for you now and as you anticipate this next wave? So, um, like I said, we're moving from stage five to four. My teaching will probably still be in a remote format because even if I have a few students who come into the building and that I see periodically, the majority of my classes or students are going to still be outside. So students have a choice? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's going to be the case through the end of the year. And um, so what I know that teachers have done and what I'm anticipating doing is the kids who are in my room will have a lesson for 45 minutes um, using their um, computers and then they get to work on things that at least then I'm in the space with them and then I can help them with things if they need help. Um, how close for comfort is going to be anybody's guess. Yeah. And um, I kind of think we'll play that by ear. Um, we're in this crazy place because our school got a new building in January. Oh. So once upon a time there was a bond package and we were slated for this new school and then on top of it, in this world of unexpectedness, we entered a pandemic, but the contractors built the building. And so we made the move in, like cleared out our classrooms in November and December and movers brought everything over to this new building. And so it's just on the back side of our campus. It's not any huge um, travel distance, um, but it's gonna, I've been in the classroom periodically Mm -hmm. um, visiting, setting it up, but you know, I keep setting it up thinking, what am I setting it up for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's going to be happening in this? I have 30 chairs, but yeah, yeah, that's um, do they have uh, masking requirements or distancing requirements, or how are you? Yes, so um, masks are definitely required. Um, I think we're still at six feet apart. Mm -hmm. um, we have, it's kind of a new style building. So we have a commons area. Uh -huh. um, it almost looks more like a university campus than it does a traditional. I've only been in old buildings all of my teaching career. So <laughs> this is super fancy. Um, and so one of the things is, is I've got a glass wall to the commons. I wonder if once I'm done with the lesson part, should they go work in the commons and I just watch them and they can wave to me and yeah. <laughs> back in for something they need or, so I'll see. We'll see, yeah. Um, um, let me glance down here. We talked to teaching now. Oh, about, about our writing space um, that we've found together through the ethical ELA um, verse love and then the um, uh, open rights. Um, what um, has this been like? This sort of third space, not your not your private life, not your teaching life, but this place with other teacher writers who you may only know from their words on the page each month. So I have really enjoyed it. I mean, I actually feel like I have a relationship with people I don't know because of their writing and. Um, so you know the rhythm of the practice that we meet for five days and um, we all give feedback to each other. And so as I'm looking to see other people's writing, there are some people who I seek out mm -hmm. in the evening because I'm still that evening person who doesn't get her writing done. Me too. If I do, it's a, a miracle. But um, so it's fun to see. And I feel like I know things about people who I don't know. Yeah through their writing. And I think that's one of the things that's particularly nice. And I also say, think, um, just like I mentioned, as I talk to my students about writing, I do feel like I can draw from my own writing experience. 
mm-hmm. that for once I can talk about either the things that I get jammed up about or the things that help me explode. Um, and just knowing that, you know, right now they're toiling with rhetorical analysis essays and, you know, your brain will learn this pattern. And the more you write, yeah. um, the more you'll be able to do it without thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. It impacts too, um, I know with, with monthly bearing of my words and then hearing things people say back to me, it, it reinforces for me the kinds of things I wanna be able to say to my students. You know, what feels heard, what feels encouraging, you know, um, so I, I enjoy that interactive part too. Now, did you participate in this before last April or was last April your beginning? Last April was my beginning. And I can't remember if I saw someone that posted a Twitter feed or a Facebook post. I can't remember where I saw it. And I just remember thinking, I'm going to do this. I had, this is a time I'm going to do it. And I suggested it to my daughter, Laura, who, you know, and she was up for it. And, you know, so you both jumped in together at the same time. Yeah. And I think it helped to have somebody who we could get a text from in the middle of the day. So what do you think about today's prompt? Yeah. 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 Nice. Because even if I don't write until the night, sometimes I will, will look in the morning just to have the idea bubbling yeah. in my head so I can think about it when I'm not thinking about it. Have you told or shared with anybody in the rest of your life that you're doing this, other colleagues or? Um, yeah, and I actually have one colleague who started last time and she really liked it. Another one who I nudged and she did it a few times in the fall, but didn't stay with it because I have colleagues who write and particularly write poetry. Um, but, you know, I guess think different things, but different people. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh. Um, as we are talking about teaching right now, uh, given your experiences, what do you think are a few of the most important issues facing teachers right now? And I don't think this question has to only be COVID, but maybe some things have come to light by way of COVID, but what do you think are the issues facing teachers right now? Um, So one thing I think, and I feel a little bit less worried about it with the change in administration, but I'm also old enough and, you know, I hate to say cynical enough that I don't think we're going to see huge changes in our nation's attitude towards public education. But I have been very worried that this is the kind of thing that could end public education. Um, Laura's in Little, in Little Rock and Arkansas is very much a charter school state. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the charter schools are funded by the Walton family. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have that high a presence of it in Austin, but what I've seen in Austin is so many people are leaving the city and we're a, I consider it an urban district that we are losing numbers of students. And so subsequently we're gonna lose schools and teaching positions. And I think we're naturally losing some of the teaching positions I said to you earlier because of just the inflexibility. Sometimes I've wondered if they're doing it intentionally because they know we're gonna come out of this with fewer students in public school Mm. and we're not gonna need the number of teachers that we once had. Um, And so, you know, in my heart, I believe that public school is a part of our democracy. Mm. Uh, You know, I even as the teacher who works alongside the AP US history teacher, I feel, you know, that this is what it's about. This is, and I tell my students, you need to be a good reader and writer so that you can understand the world you're entering as an adult and participate. And, you know, I was proud to see that voting seemed to pay off this year and make them believe in those kinds of things. Um, But things are far from perfect right now as we're, having a second impeachment trial today of the <laughs> president. You know, um, there are just things that are so hard to explain. I mean, in January, after the attack on the Capitol, you know, I told the girls, I said, I don't even know how to talk to you about this. I said, you know, every image of my country was trashed yesterday by this action. And part of me doesn't feel surprised by it, but part of me is just torn up that this is where we are. And I do worry that public education is a part of this erosion of um, 
So to not let it be a negative, I do feel like um, focusing on things like equity and what's really important, including all people is really what we need to move towards as educators. And that's what I would say to move towards. I would say that to my children to recognize everyone who's there, everyone who's at the table and um, not looking at marginalized um, groups of people as being in the margins, bring them to the table with everyone because that is what this democracy is about. Um, so if something like this disease is gonna have that kind of impact, then I think we need to find the kinds of things to focus on that are still important to who we are as a nation and public school being that piece of that. Absolutely. Well, we've been talking for um, just about an hour and I, I want to respect your time. And I was wondering, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that I haven't asked about? So, yeah. Um, and so it's more about the experience of writing mm -hmm. and um, what came up for me during this time. And so April was this space where I had more time, more time to get the writing done. And I guess more time for me and I mentioned to you earlier, but not on the, in this conversation that my mom had passed away in, in August of 2019. And um, I'm sure for anybody with a mom that they felt close with, losing a mom is something that takes a while to figure out what it is that it means. And so I wrote about her a lot during the month of April. And sometimes I found I wrote about her when I didn't think I was writing about her. So um, it was nice to have that space to get to think about her and to think about who she was in my life. And, you know, I always say to my students when they think it's so bad, it's like, I still have my parents, you know, physically not in this space, but you know, who else taught me all these things I know how to do. And um, they're certainly not lost to me. So I have a poem called Saltwater Taffy that um, I will share with you about a birthday party at my house where my mother let us make saltwater taffy. I would love to hear it again. <laughs> Mom stood at the stove stirring the melting sugar and watched the thermometer, the pot handle held by the mitt, the light blonde liquid thickening by the spoon, a swirl of lines led by the spoon pulls the edges from the sides of the pot. Lightly buttered fingers hold on to globs of hardened sugar, pulling and pulling till the strands grow thinner and lighter. Strands of candy rest on sheets of wax paper waiting to harden. Fine strands of candy pulled between fingers, creating a web of sugar, touching every kitchen surface. That's just lovely. I think of that, um, I feel it's such a strong metaphor of the pulling between you and your mother and the, um, the creating that's happening there her to you, it's beautiful. And so I think it takes being a mom to realize what a great deal that was for my mom to allow a <laughs> full of little girls to pull taffy one night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. You know, I always say to kids, parents and adults always wanna say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime you're asking for something, you always want to be able to say yes. And so that was one of those times she said yes. And and, the, and what a vivid memory. And you shared it so beautifully there. Thank you so much. You. Well, this was just really fun to hear your poems and your thoughts. And I've really enjoyed our time together. Um, uh, we do have a formal uh, ending for this. And that is... Um, uh, uh, let me, oh, hang on a second. I am so sorry. I'm supposed to stop the recording before I say this part. <laughs> That's okay. They'll cut it out. Okay. That's that signing of the gift, which we've already done. So I think we're, I think we're okay. I think then we could just draw this to a close. And I want to thank you again so much, Jamie. And I'm really going to look forward to reading your poems this week. We start again this weekend, don't we? And, and, and we have a long uh, weekend. And it's, and it's been really fun to now meet your daughter and you both. And I wish you the best. Okay. Well, thank All you. All right. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.